It's 1.45, so it's time for us to start. Good afternoon, friends, and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for the public seminar on global trade and SMEs. To formally begin our um, event, may I call on Dr. Sheila for the uh, opening remarks. Magandang tanghali po sa inyong lahat. Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of uh, Dr. Celia Reyes, I would like to uh, welcome you all to our public seminar on uh, global trade and SMEs. I also would like to acknowledge um, my uh, fellow civil servants in government, as well as the representatives from um, academe, um, civil society, the private sector, and uh, we are uh, very grateful for your presence today. First of all, allow me to say a few words about the vital role of research and development, as this is one of the um, um, most talked about topics these days after a senator <laughs> questioned the budget allocated to it, because according to her, um, research doesn't benefit the people. Well, after that comment, if you are closely following uh, the news, no, the good senator was heavily criticized in the social media, in uh, newspapers, and even in the broadcast media. And in the online community, um, in defense of research, people began posting articles about scientific breakthroughs that uh, came out of research and which benefited humanity. Well, um, these are good moves, no? But, but for me, a better way to uh, use our time is not so much on the criticizing, but more on the reflecting. Wh what do I mean by that? Well, for organization, organizations like us, like PIDS, whose main mandate is to do research, and uh, regardless of um, what branch of science you belong to, whether it is biological science, whether it is uh, um, physical science or social science, the senator's comment actually is a wake-up call for research organizations to, us, to ask ourselves, are we doing a good job in making sure our research results are reaching those who should know it and who should benefit from it? Or are we just letting our studies gather dust in, our, in, in the shelves? No? If there is a perception um, that research is not benefiting people, we should ask ourselves why. Maybe we are partly to blame. In a 1996 study by Martin Cave and Stephen Haney titled Assessment of Research Impact on Non-Academic Audiences, the authors noted that um, of the 70,000 project, 70, projects on education, only 70 has a, had a significant influence on education policy and practice, 70 out of 70,000, which means that less than 1% or a minuscule percentage of 0.001% of those research projects was used. Based on the research, they gave 10 reasons why research is often ignored. Most of the reasons refer to poor dissemination and communication, such as inadequate supply of and access to relevant information, ineffective communication of research, time lag between dissemination of research, and impact on policy and gaps in understanding between researchers, policymakers, and, and the public. So this clearly shows the important role that research dissemination and communication play in getting the research out there so it can be used by its, by its intended users. It also underscores the necessity of providing effective channels to facilitate dialogue among the government, the private sector, academic, and civil society. At, here at PIDS, we use public seminars like this as a channel, not just to disseminate the uh, results of our policy studies, but uh, to provide um, channels of uh, communication and open discussion with development actors and stakeholders, guided by the insights of our researchers on current and emerging development issues. The topic of our seminar today, which is global trade and SMEs, is very timely as we are witnessing Recent developments in international trade, one, one of which is the trade conflict or trade tension between the U.S. and China. And according to some economists, this could potentially benefit the Philippines in terms of trade redirection. Hence, to maximize the opportunities that come with a trade, with a trade war, we need to strengthen our, mi our micro, small, and medium enterprises. To say that our MSMEs are the backbone of our economy is an understatement. After all, 
They comprise uh, about 99.5% of registered firms and 61.6% .6 of employment in our country. So we need to build or to provide a conducive environment that will help our um, MSMEs um, thrive and compete not only locally but also internationally. And this afternoon, uh, a PIDS consultant, Mr. Tristan Cana Canale of the Asian Institute of um, Asian Development Bank will tell us uh, about the stumbling blocks that make it difficult for our SMEs to um, sustain their participation in the global market. Another presentation this time by Dr. Francis Kimba, one of our senior research fellows here at PIDS and currently the uh, project director of the Philippine Apex Study Centers Network, will help us uh, better understand uh, non-tariff uh, measures or NTMs and how these are affecting um, our uh, trade activities. As, um, in terms of uh, SMEs, no, NTMs can be detrimental to their development and internationalization. And then for our last presentation, Dr. Connie de Koykoy, who's also one of uh, our senior research fellows here at PIDS, will discuss her and Dr. Ramonet Serafika's assessment of the sophistication of the country's existing export basket using the product space concept. And from this, Dr. Uh, de Koykoy will tackle, uh, will give their prescription on uh, possible uh, trade diversification strategies that the country can pursue. And this paper is likewise instructive for our SMEs in terms of promoting and sustaining their presence in the global market. So on behalf of Dr. Reyes, I would like to thank uh, our resource speakers as well as their, um, their uh, co-authors for their research works and for um, taking the time to uh, be here today to share their uh, research studies. I also would like to thank all of you for your presence today, and I look forward to everyone's active participation during the open forum. So we hope that the concerned agencies will have an open mind and also consider our, um, the policy, the uh, research results and the policy recommendations from these three studies, and um, you will use them in uh, coming up with more relevant um, programs and policies or in fine-tuning existing ones for the benefit of our SMEs and for um, the expansion of our global trade. So, so that at the end of the day, no one will say that research is useless or research has been useless. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shiar, for giving us something to ponder on about research. Let me introduce our first um, speaker this afternoon. He is a senior research fellow here at PIDS. He has worked on a number of research topics, including agriculture, agricultural trade and rural development. He is currently working on quantifying the impact of external linkages of product innovation of uh, Philippine firms. He obtained his uh, PhD in development economics from the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan. Our, last, uh, our, our first speaker will talk about his paper on, on non-tariff measures in the Philippines, which he co-authored with Mr. Silwin Calizo. Friends, I give you Dr. Francis Mark Kimba. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, your presence here today. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, non-tariff measures in the Philippines. Um, it's a stock taking of um, what are these non-tariff measures, and also it's not enough to, un to understand what these are, but also to see how they are they affecting our um, trade performance. So I will go, th the, the, the outline of the presentation will be as follows. It's, um, I think it would be good to begin with a definition and also some examples before I move on to the objectives of the study so that um, peop um, most of us will have a more concrete understanding of what are non-tariff measures. And then I will um, quickly discuss um, how we went about um, quantifying the incidence and the coverage and uh, 
the prevalence of these indicators or of these um, uh, non-tariff measures and then look at some of our results uh, and then some of the correlations before I proceed to the conclusion and recommendation. So non-tariff measures are policy measures other than ordinary customs tariffs that can potentially have an economic effect on international trade in goods, changing quantities traded or prices or both. And this is a definition that was, um, that's used by UNCTAD. And um, it, from, the, from the figure, as you can see, that the two lines are uh, depicting the trend of tariffs from 2000 to 2015, and from as many as around nine, nine, uh, nine average tariffs for that's being applied in 2000, we, we only have around um, five to a little more than six um, tariffs on the average that's being applied in 2015. So there's clearly a downward trend. But as um, the tariffs go down from 2000, we see an increase, a marked increase of the number of non-tariff measures. The, the non-tariff measures are, are somewhat replacing our, our tariffs. And um, because of the definition, because it's, um, it is, the way it was defined is anything that is not um, including uh, ordinary customs tariffs. So it's actually a very broad definition. It would include some technical standards like the cyto phytosanitary measures, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, and then the technical barriers to trade, which are um, technical standards. Then we also have quotas, price controls, and also it would include um, some contingent trade protective measures, such as anti-dumping and uh, safeguard measures. And even um, behind the border or um, local domestic measures that would affect the operation of firms in, in, in the domestic market or local content requirements, and even trade-related investment measures could be counted as non-tariff measures. So all these measures are examples of really this big category of uh, non-tariff measures. And because it's such a big concept, so the, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, or UNCTAD, has decided to work with, a, has, um, as part of a multi-agency support team group, has tried to come up with a taxonomy of all these NTMs. So it begins with a chapter heading, for instance, that's defined by a letter. And um, the summary is um, there on the right. Yeah. Um, so the, there's actually three types of technical measures, A, B, and C, and then non-technical measures um, ranging from D to O, and then export um, measures uh, for letter P. So the chapter headings are actually um, given by, by the letter, and then there are subgroups to make it more specific. For instance, subgroup one of cyto sanitary phytosanitary measures would include um, prohibition of imports for SPS reasons. And um, so that's A1, or A8 would be some conformity assessment. Then it goes further down to be more specific. Um, for example, A11 would be a temporary geographic restriction um, for SBS. And um, further breaking down into uh, subgroup three to be more, even more specific would focus on, for example, a conformity assessment traceability requirements, focusing on very specific origin of materials and parts. Uh, but this taxonomy is not um, the only way we can um, identify or and even categorize um, non-tariff measures. Edrington and Ruta in 2016 actually came up of a way of, um, four cat of classifying um, non-tariff measures into four categories, customs, process, product, and consumer. Um, 
later you will see how these are, uh, why am I uh, mentioning this? Because they are actually related to how trade is performing or how our trade um, is performing. But just to provide an explanation, the way it was defined by Edirington and Ruta, for instance, customs regulations is not, are not the regulations um, imposed by customs, but actually regulations that drive a wedge between the world price and the domestic price. And these would include inspection fees, imports, export taxes. Um, product regulations would be the ones that would affect the characteristic of the products. So safety standards would be included there. And consumer regulations, um, primarily consumption taxes and regulations, which directly affect the final price paid by the consumers without in adding anything to the cost of production. And then finally, the process regulations um, affect producer prices uh, as they regulate the methods of production. So uh, later I will go back to this and uh, discuss this um, further um, through the, the um, presentation of the results. But okay, so let's go, um, let's just quickly go through each chapter. So uh, as can be seen here, A, B, and C are technical measures. And what do we mean by technical measures? So technical measures pertain to the physical characteristics, technical specifications, or production process used on a certain product. And there are three main chapters really under um, technical measures, as I mentioned earlier, the sanitary and phytosanitary measures, technical measures, or TBTs, and the pre-shipment inspection for chapter C. The, the SPS, or the sanitary to sanitary measures, uh, includes all measures and restrictions related to food safety and disease prevention. This would include specific requirements such as certification, testing, inspection, and quarantine. While TBT measures include regulations related to technical standards and specifications, including quality requirements. While well, Chapter C would include all measures related to pre-shipment inspections and other customs documentations and formalities. So A, B, and C are the um, technical measures. Then we have uh, a very long list of uh, non-technical measures, so that's covering Chapters D to Chapter O. Um, but I want to focus on um, Chapters E and F, which um, um, UNCTAD 2015, and the Melo and Nikita in 2018 would call um, hard group of measures because they are um, measures of, because these two are measures, for example, chapter E includes measures aimed at uh, limiting the volume of imports regardless of source, but ex excluding measures related to SPS and TBT. So um, really quantitative restrictions. While chapter F, um, controls or affects the prices of imported goods for a number of reasons. So um, any reason that you can possibly think of. So it would include supporting the domestic price of certain products when import prices of these goods are lower. Or another reason would be establishing the domestic price of certain products. Even um, uh, preserving tax revenue um, is an, is, could be a reason for um, price controls. Then chapter um, G would cover um, finance measures. So it restricts the payments of imports um, or some of the measures that would in be included in chapter G would include um, restricting payments of imports when foreign exchange is regulated, um, those imposing restrictions on the terms of payments, while um, chapter H uh, would cover um, state um, competition um, measures, which would include state trading or um, monopolies with uh, sole importing agencies or um, compulsory national insurance or transport. Okay. So chapter I, okay, okay, so good. So chapter I refers to trade-related investment measures. So this would include measures that require foreign investors to source from local manufacturers. Um, 
These could measures could be likened to tariffs on imported intermediate goods, essentially inducing firms to resort to local products, which sometimes may be more expensive. These measures could also be viewed as a quantitative restriction preventing um, importation of certain intermediate goods. Then chapter J, measures affecting the distribution of imported products, um, is related to the internal distribution. So once it has entered in the country. So these would include measures allowing the existence of a monopoly on the importation of specific products or the mandatory importing, import licensing regulations um, would also be included in Chapter J. Uh, chapter K would cover restrictions on the provisions of af after sales and ancillary services. So this would include also restrictions to the, um, to the extent that these could hamper the importation of foreign products. So for example, um, it's a, uh, you, you try to import a car, but there's um, restriction on the provision of um, accessory services, then that would also be included in, it, that restriction would be included as a non-tariff measure to the extent that it would prevent or hamper the importation of certain cars. All right. Okay, so we continue with a very long list. So chapter M would include um, procurement measures that cover um, restrictions on foreign companies as they attempt to sell to the national government. Chapter N refers to the intellectual property measures, leg um, patents, trademarks, industrial designs, and finally, rules of origin, chapter O, which are not necessarily non-tariff barriers, but to the extent that they could be used as um, uh, by customs authorities to uh, determine the nationality of the product or the inputs used um, and could be used to um, then to the point that the, it can be used to um, limit uh, the trade or affect trade, then it could be considered as a non-tariff measure. And then the last would be export measures. So measures applied by a country on its exports. And it would include taxes, export quotas, export prohibitions, and the like. Okay. So if you're already confused, <laughs> because all of all that of those abstract concepts, I've decided to maybe present to some of you some of the things that are already in the database. Uh, so uh, you have to pardon the DTI there. I, I included that because they're the ones in, um, um, implementing the number three on the manufactured goods. Anyway, uh, so here are examples of technical measures. As you can remember, or if you can remember, chapter A, B, and C are the technical measures, SPS, DBT, and um, uh, chap chapter C. So, uh, I've, I have here some of the some examples. So let's just look at um, agriculture imports. Number one, um, there is an SPS measure governing fish and fishery products from Japan, and specifically, it's Memorandum Order Number One, Series of 2011, on the pre and post border requirements in the application of SPS clearance on, for the importation of fish fishery products from Japan. And uh, this measure applies to all fish and fishery products from the prefectures of Fukushima, Ibaraki, Tochigi, and Gunma. And, it sh and for those products, it should include uh, imports from those um, prefectures should include radionuclide test results for iodine-131, cesium-134, and cesium-137 from a competent authority of Japan, showing that the products conform with the guidelines of, um, for representative nu radionuclides in food under the Philippine Nuclear Research Institute AO1 series of 2009. So why did I choose that? Because in 2011, if you can remember, there was a very big earthquake in Japan, and it affected the uh, 
what the nuclear power plant. And uh, very sp and the, actually the location of that nuclear power plant is in Fukushima. That's why they, they're calling it uh, the, the Fukushima uh, nuclear power plant. And so all the fish that's very in very near that area has to be subjected to a new type of SPS. So that's, that's the reason why there's an SPS. So we understand that the reason for this uh, SPS is really on food safety. Okay. So let's go with the second one. Um, there's a technical barrier to trade um, implemented by, um, well, of course, implemented by the Bureau of Plant Industry on the importation of fresh vegetables, celery, lettuce, and crucifers from the United States. And there's a la labeling regulation for consignments that have, so for consignments that have satisfactorily passed in inspection, each carton or box is required to be sealed and labeled with the following information conspicuously displayed on two sides of the box. For the Philippines, in quotes, for the Philippines, information label that includes the country or district of origin and the individual shipper or grower. So that's the um, technical barrier to trade uh, related to um, vegetable products. Incidentally, in February 2015, uh, okay, so um, number three um, for another example of agricultural imports, RA 9296 uh, of the Meat Inspection Code, as amended by R810536, has required that all meat exporters to the Philippines must comply with all other Philippine import requirements prior to the shipment of meat and meat products into the country and covering fresh, chilled, frozen edible carcass, including the offal delivered, derived from food animals and products made wholly or in part from meat. And tasked to implement this is the National Meat Inspection Service. Okay, so um, technical barriers to trade really um, looks at uh, food safety. So they, they um, look at very specific um, food products related to fish, vegetables, meat, and then they um, impose uh, SPS or even labeling risk requirements or even um, inspection measures. But um, technical measures if we try to think about it, so if if they apply to food, you know, and uh, if they have food safety, well, yeah, that's um, logical. But there actually, there also there can al they can also be applied to manufactured goods, and um, those three are examples. So there's an actually an SPS on used vehicles, earth moving equipment, and container vans. So in nine, it's actually a very old law. So it's in 1981. The Bureau of Plant Industry is mandated by PD number 1433 promulgating the Plant Quarantine Law of 1978. So, um, okay. Plant quarantine some inspection of all used vehicles, earth moving equipment, and container vans to determine that they are free from soils, sand, or earth and those found contaminated shall be required to be disinfected or washed and cleaned thoroughly. So even if it's just a, manu uh, a manufactured product, it still needs to, it may still be um, regulated by an SPS or a TBT. So another example would be um, those covering household appliances. So mostly the technical barriers to trade. So the F Bureau of Philippine Product Standards would have some specification on um, the inspection of all these um, uh, household appliances, lights and lighting, wiring devices, wires and cables, mechanical and construction materials, including chemical and consumer products. So it's actually a very big, big range of um, household appliances and products that has to be inspected and uh, has by the um, Bureau of uh, Product Standards, and uh, the rules are in the in the new rules and regulations and issuances for the use of the product certification mark. Okay, so I hope you have um, some idea of what um, these NTMs are all about, what are they are regulating. 
And here are some examples of um, non technical measures. So technical measures, those that are SPS and TBT, they, they, um, they pertain to some uh, food safety or a product standard. But um, the non-technical measures are a bit more, more different. So for example, um, so let's just um, pick one in the interest of time. Uh, so chapters E, So chapter E is a quantitative restriction, if you can remember. Chapter F, uh, price controls, and chapter G, finance measures. So this is mostly EFG. So quantitative restriction, finance measures, and what's the other one? Uh, price control and finance measures. Okay, so for example, let's look at um, Chapter F, so number two of agricultural import. So processing fee charged per bill of lading for the importation of rice. So according to the general, uh, well, maybe this is not applicable anymore because of the Rice Tariffication Act, but anyway, there, as of the, when this was written, when the paper was written, the general guidance for guidelines for the importation of um, 163,000 metric tons of well-milled rice under the minimum access volume country-specific quota program for 2014, the import permit shall be issued upon payment of a processing fee of 2,000 pesos per bill of lading. So this is actually a, a, a payment that you actually have to pay in order for you to be able to import. But this is not a tariff. So that's why it counts as a, a different um, non-tariff measure because it's something that's um, ad hoc or something that is imposed separate from a, a tariff. Uh, okay. So there, there um, again, as was presented earlier, the, the examples apply to both agricultural imports and to the manufacturing imports. Okay, so what else do we know about non-tariff measures? So I've presented to you some examples, but maybe you, um, some of the earlier studies on non-tariff measures in the Philippines, they've also found out that all product lines, all imports in the Philippines is subject to some form of non-tariff measure. And this was a study conducted by the Dios in 2015. And since 1976, all imports of the Philippines has been subject to some form of uh, non-tariff measures. Uh, there's also around 37 issuing institutions that are tasked to implement these um, non-tariff measures. And here is the breakdown. So who, is the, who are the gov government agencies? So the Department of Agriculture has about 422 non-tariff measures. Well, that's, that's expected because, you know, um, under the Department of Agriculture, we have the Bureau of Animal Industry, the Bureau of Plant Industry, and the Bureau of um, Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. So um, they divide among themselves some of the, the, these 422 regulations. And then you have also some um, uh, other Agencies like the DTI, which, which also has uh, in charge of the Bureau of, of monitoring some of the product standards. But what is interesting is also there are some agent, agencies that, has, um, that does not perform importation or regulation that's related to importation. For instance, DSWD has one, or DepEd has nine, and even the Office of the President has. 41 um, regulations. So specifically, I, I, I was curious about what is this uh, only um, non-tariff measure that the DSWD is implementing, and I think it's related to the importation of used clothing. So mga ukay-ukay nyo dyan. Mga illegal yan. No. 
I don't remember. <laughs> Actually, I don't remember anymore. But I, I can check. Um, what are the specific um, regulations um, specific to? Um, Actually, uh, let me show you some uh, a graph. Okay, but um, yes, uh, ammunition actually is something that's very, very much regulated. Um, anything that's um, related to ammunition. So you, um, there's actually a product code, um, HS19, I think, is um, arms and ammunition and uh, that's really covered, 100%. Um, but I'm not sure if that's the one that's being regulated by the, um, the ILG. Okay, but we're not that bad when it comes to um, non-tariff measures. I mean, uh, some of our partners in, in the region are actually also using non-tariff measures. Thailand has uh, 869, we're a very distant second. And um, Malaysia, Indonesia, they're, they're also um, imposing non-tariff measures. But what is interesting is, um, it, because the non-tariff measures are actually very, the, the, the scope is actually quite big and it's very difficult to compare. How do you compare an SPS on meat versus an SPS on, um, as I mentioned earlier, the second-hand vehicles. So for, in order for us to be able to compare um, non-tariff measures, it would be good to calculate ad valorem equivalent. So if you're going to translate them into a tariff, what is the, the value of this um, non-tariff measure as a tariff? So that's what we call an ad valorem equivalent. And um, on the average, the NTMs of APEC economies is around um, 10. 10%. So it's at around, an, uh, on average, you're imposing an additional 10% to the imports. Uh, so earlier we have Thailand, which is leading. And if you can see here, Thailand's NTM is actually, or ad valorem equivalent of the uh, 800 plus NTMs is around just 5%. So it's not really about the quantity, but it's really about um, in terms of um, the ad valorem equivalent is, if you translate that, what is it, um, how much is it in terms of uh, as a tariff? So for the Philippines, the average ad valorem equivalent is around 30, close to 30%. So the interpretation would be, uh, we on top of the, the tariff that we are imposing, there's around roughly, and on average, about 30% um, tariff be coming from the non-tariff measures, which is actually quite big. So um, one thing to note also would be the, the 273 of non-tariff measures of um, Malaysia is actually around more than 30% uh, ad valorem equivalent. Okay, but I think it's also important to see um, how are firms behaving when they are faced with uh, non-tariff measures. So again, um, and this is another study by uh, the ITC in 2016, and they surveyed a number of companies and looked at um, how are the companies reacting to the non-tariff measures, and they see that or they found that um, the biggest barrier to trade are not the number of regulations per se, but the accompanying procedural obstacles. And what are these procedural obstacles? These are the, those that are measures that would include um, administrative burden, information and transparency issues, inconsistency or discriminatory behavior of um, the, Im the implement agencies or officials, time constraints, infrastructure challenges. So the measures per se are not really that, um, uh, are not really that big as a barrier or perceived as a barrier, but actually the, how it's actually being 
operationalized that's affecting the SMEs. And okay. So that's actually the introduction to what we're doing. <laughs> so, so why why are we so after all those things, why why am why are we still doing this? Well, because we still don't understand how directly NTMs are affecting our trade performance. Um, also because the NTMs are actually, they actually have or affect our commitment or some of our international commitments. For instance, um, goal two of um, the sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, which calls for ending hunger, um, also look want um, also calls to prevent trade restrictions and distortions in world agricultural markets, and that's very much directed directly related to the NTMs. Goal nine, which um, is related to industry innovation infrastructure, notes the need for quality, reliable, and sustainable and resilient infrastructure including regional and transborder infrastructure and increasing the integration of small scale industrial and other enterprises into the international value chains. And that would also be affected by our, um, how, how we utilize NTMs to improve the performance of our um, MSMEs. And um, also for, for the, the country's um, Philippine development plan, which calls for um, the str a strategy on implementing a strategic external trade policy regime to meet the goal of an enabling and supporting macroeconomic uh, environment, we feel that we need to understand um, what are the laws and regulations that um, may affect our exporters and importers. So that's why we thought of um, looking at um, non-tariff measures. Oh, okay. Um, also, NTMs have um, a very specific implication to industrial development. So, in 2016, Ing and uh, colleagues um, have looked at or have studied NTMs, and they found that um, certain industries, for example, automotive industry, is um, heavily regulated, and that is one of the key industries that we have in the Philippines. Also, textiles. Uh, economically strategic sector, but um, uh, safety standards are not really that, um, or are actually of secondary importance when it comes to textiles. I mean, but um, it's still heavily regulated by NTMs. So there's actually uh, some um, room for um, studying and uh, looking back at, into the regulations. Okay, but uh, I need to mention some of the limitations. For example, the, there's the database that we use, that's um, the, uh, the trains and the ITIP portal by uh, UNGTAD actually relies on notifications by the, by the country themselves. So it's a, there's a little bit of, there's an issue on uh, comprehensiveness. And uh, while most of the, well, while I'm going to present also some indicators for exports, the focus really, a lot of it is really on um, imports because as you can see from the, the way uh, the NTMs were classified, a lot of the measures are really pertaining to um, imports with, with only one chapter for exports. And also there's an endogeneity of the indicators. What does this mean? Uh, for which affects, what's the direction of caus causality, or what affects the other? Do the NTMs actually affect importation, or is it because we don't really import anymore, or we don't really even bother importing s these certain products, so that's why there's no NTMs. So what's, uh, what's the direction? So um, just try to keep in mind that there's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that there are actually some limitations when it comes to these databases. I have time. 
All right. So um, what, what we did is we looked at three um, main um, indices. So the first is a coverage ratio, um, looking at the value of trade. Um, what's, the, what's the coverage? Uh, okay, so I think uh, a good way of um, understanding this would be um, looking at the denominator of each of the, the uh, indices. So for coverage ratio, the denominator is total trade value. Um, for the, so if it's the total trade value, the, it's a percentage of the total trade imports that's subject to a certain NTM. Uh, for the frequency ratio, the denominator is the number of products, product lines. So um, if that's the denominator, the index is actually the number of products that's subject to a certain NTM for a certain industry. And the prevalence score, it has the same denominator with um, the frequency index. But the difference is that in the numerator, instead of NTM, there's the hashtag, hashtag NTMK. And that is the number. So that's the average number of NTMs for a certain um, indicator. So, okay. so we try to calculate um, all these frequency ratios for us, um, almost all the chapters and for all the um, industry groups. And then we looked at um, how the industry groups could be classified. So they could be classified by agriculture, natural resources, manufacturing, or by um, broad economic classification or um, consumption, capital, intermediate goods. And then uh, I mentioned earlier um, the theory-based classification but, um, devised by Edrington and Ruta. And we used the letter C to look at um, some scatter plots and correlation between trade performance. Okay. okay, so this is where we got some of the data. Okay, so one of the findings is that agriculture, natural resources, manufacturing, coverage ratio is very close to 100%. It's almost all the trade is um, covered. But there's, um, it's very interesting. I'm trying to um, go back to the data and try to uh, figure out what's the 22.9% um, of the natural resources that's um, accounting for the 0.2% of the value of the natural imports that's not covered by NTMs. But um, if we're going to look at specifically agriculture and manufacturing, the, the frequency index and coverage ratio is very close to 100, signifying that there's a very, that both um, sectors are um, regulated by, by NTMs. So uh, the, my curiosity on the natural resources brought me to this. Um, so live animals, vegetable products, animal or vegetable products, so those are the agriculture. So we try to break them down further so we can see um, what is affecting the natural resources. Uh, and we see that the so mineral products and natural or cultured pearls, I think, that's not, and that would include um, base metals and something. Let me just go back to my definitions. So it's essentially, yeah, it's mineral products and natural cultured pearls, chapter 14, yes. Natural or cultured pearls, precious or semi-precious stones, precious metals, clad with metals clad with precious metals. So those are the ones that's contributing to the natural resources that's not, um, that has a very small frequency index. So, okay, so let me, so it's, we, the value is, uh, so it's, uh, there's actually a lot of the products, but the value of those that we are importing is actually quite small. So um, I I was curious about the technical measures. So what are we what are we regulating in terms of SPS? 
So clearly it's mostly agriculture, but there are also some manufactured goods that is regulated by um, some SPS measures. For instance, um, wood, wood products, vehicles, aircrafts, uh, so those are actually also uh, regulated by some SPS measures. But consistent with uh, other studies, we found that actually the TBTs, the technical barriers to trade, the manufacturing, they are the ones that are um, actually high uh, coverage ratio and covering almost all, all of the products. We also saw that uh, there's a high coverage ratio for all types of goods, uh, capital goods, consumption goods, and intermediate goods. And uh, so the, the observation by Ng et al., which mentions um, the implication for um, industrial development actually could be traced to this because um, intermediate goods, the importation of intermediate goods, which and capital goods, which may affect um, industrial development in terms of the production of our companies, um, is actually very high. Okay, so we want to look at the specific number. So, what's the number of uh, measures that's applied to um, our products. So on average, there's about 12 regulations applied to Philippine imports. And uh, consistent with the other figures, it's the agriculture products that have high, that have a, um, a bit higher number of um, NTMs. And, and this is driven mostly by the, the, the brown color for letter A, that's the, the SPS. But it's interesting to note that um, F and G, the price measures and the finance measures, so specifically F6, additional taxes and charges levied in connection to services provided by government, and G1, advanced payment requirements are the primary technical, non-technical NTMs affecting Philippine imports. And you can see that um, there's a lot, um, it covers a lot, the entire range of um, products. And if, if there's a way to, for example, maybe eliminate them as non-tariff measures, you can actually see that there's, it, it brings down the average um, very significantly. Okay, so this is my only result for exports. Um, P1 to 9, they're specifically looking at um, uh, certain types of export measures. Um, and uh, so if you can recall, we have a very large classification of imports. So what, they, what the classification did was, for example, there's also technical measures for export measures. That's P6. So the SPS, TBTs, uh, something similar to that would fall under P6. And P6 is applied mostly to the Philippine exports. Uh, if you can see, that's actually a, a, a lot of them. And perhaps this is to ensure that what we are exporting would meet the international standards. Because of course, there, that would include the TBTs. Okay. So, but um, these indices are just counting. We're just counting and trying to look at averages. But um, how are they related to export performance? So we tried to, well, because um, export and trade performance is not really just driven by NTMs, although it could affect, NTMs could affect trade performance. So we, because we, don't have a large data set that would try to control for a number of things affecting trade performance. We just wanted to look at simple correlations. And so we just looked at scatter plots. 
and we tried to relate, for instance, um, the number of non-tariff measures with the growth of exports um, during the period 2013 to 2015, where these um, um, non-tariff measures are actually enforced. So what we see here is that if we are looking at all non-tariff measures, regardless of um, objective, and excluding the export measures, because of course they won't be related to your imports, we see that there's actually no correlation <laughs> doing, after doing all those things. They, they don't really affect your growth of imports, which is un well, a little bit understandable because you know, the, 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 the objective of those imports are actually, um, aver or objective of those measures may be averaged out. So, okay, let's see if the, there's a difference between technical and non-technical measures. So we looked at SPS and TBTs because these are measures that are actually looking at, for, for example, consumer, um, uh, consumer safety or food safety. And if we're looking specifically at the technical measures, we actually see that there's, again, no, specific, no significant relationship. But if we are looking at the non-technical measures, so these are the ones that are a little bit, well, as if you can say, um, it's a little bit ad hoc. You, there's really, you, you, you impose um, some additional fees or additional charges. There's, you can actually see that there's, the re well, I'm, I'm not sure if this statistically significant, but we see that the correlation is negative. And it's, um, the magnitude is relatively bigger than what we see here, um, which is uh, actually very close to zero. So there seems to be some uh, negative correlation between the number of no NTMs that's non-technical, so um, E, F, G, and the growth of your imports. Okay, so we tried to investigate this further. Um, what about um, certain types of NTMs following the theory of Etherington and Ruta? So Etherington and Ruta mentioned that um, consumer NTMs, those that would affect uh, consumer, uh, the prices that consumers would pay, actually also has a negative relationship with the growth of our imports. So, um, or a negative correlation with our, the growth of our imports. Similarly, for the customs, I have to, the, the customs NTMs actually also have a negative relationship with, um, the, with our imports. Okay, yes. so, because these are, these are actually the the NTMs that would actually affect the prices that's paid by the, by the consumers and also the prices that would um, be paid by the manufacturers. But an interesting result would be there's, there's a positive correlation between process NTMs and an import growth. So which may, be, may lead us to think that some regulations may actually benefit international trade as it can actually reduce information by, for example, labeling or um, product quality or certif by, through certification. And it can actually reflect um, commitment to some, some goals like uh, labor and environmental standards. So there's actually um, s certain NTMs that could actually um, push uh, the growth of our imports. But there, those are the, the process NTMs, those that um, specifically reduce um, information cost or improve product quality. So if that's true for imports, maybe we, we tried to investigate also if it's true for um, exports. So we saw that um, the prevalence scores for export-related measures, because remember there's a very high um, or there's a lot of also um, export measures. We see that there's um, a negative relationship between NTMs and the growth rate of our exports, specifically the export-related measures. But the relationship, if we are looking at 
um, the product and the process measures, again, the ones that would affect um, the quality of our products, uh, even um, provide a signal as to the, uh, for example, labeling, um, and even commitment to certain uh, goals, they actually have a positive re correlation with the growth of export markets. So uh, as can be seen in, on the, the other panel. Okay, so finally. So what, what have we seen so far? So we've seen that um, NTMs covers both agriculture and manufacturing, and we don't um, treat NTMs a bit differently, or we don't treat those sectors differently. Agriculture is just as re um, highly regulated as manufacturing. But there's actually a high um, prevalence score for agricultural goods, 19.8. Um, so that means there's an average of about close to 20 um, uh, regulations for agricultural products as against uh, manufacturing goods, which only has uh, around nine um, on the average. We also regulate capital goods and consumption goods equally. They have um, a high um, coverage ratios. And the last three um, conclusions are actually based on the, the figures I've shown earlier. Um, in general, there's no association of um, NTMs with the growth of imports, but the number of non-technical measures show a negative correlation with imports growth. Import growth is negatively correlated with consumer and customs NTMs, but there's a positive correlation with uh, process NTMs. And similarly for um, imports, Product and process uh, for exports, product and process NTMs show a positive correlation for export growth and growth of export markets. So for policy recommendations, we, ha we reiterate the finding of um, ITC 2016 that um, because the NTMs as shown earlier specifically, they don't affect um, the number don't affect um, growth or of, of imports. So, which may lead us to really support what the ITC is. It's not really about the number, but the number of procedural obstacles that's affecting um, trade performance. And these would include delays, the numerous administrative windows or redundant documents, and even the informal payments that affect um, ex um, trade performance. There's also a need to review the non-technical measures, particularly chapters F and G, um, as these cover most of the non-traded, uh, of the goods traded by the Philippines. Also, um, to facilitate the, because um, transparency is actually very important when it comes to NTMs. So, and um, there's also a need to um, work towards the completion of the Philippine National Single Window to improve trade facilitation and reduce the procedural obstacles. Um, related to that would be strengthening the Philippine National Trade Repository, which lists a lot of all the uh, NTMs that the, the Philippines actually imposes on all our imports. In order to provide um, a means for um, importers or exporters of a means of um, having only one source of information for all our NTMs. Also, ensuring the quality of our exports is of primary importance. As we have seen, the specific um, NTMs, the process NTMs, actually, which affect the quality of your Im of exports, has a positive correlation with the growth of your export markets. So government policy should be to really to provide an assistance to ensure that the international standards are met. And uh, for a lot of SM MSMEs, this is actually quite difficult. So there's, um, uh, there's really a need for government to support um, meeting, um, uh, meeting the, standard, the international standards. And finally, the, the work is not Finally, the work is not done. There's really a need to further um, study the, the, the NTMs and, and really look at um, the minute details. 
and also what we have presented are just correlations. So it's also very important to look at um, really what, what is the significant relationship and um, what is um, the direction of uh, causality. So thank you very much and um, hoping to hear from you. you first question. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive presentation, Dr. Kimba. I understand that you have to leave early, but before we let you go, we'll entertain three questions from the audience for you. Yes. So would like to ask the first question. Yes, sir. Attorney Silicius. Delicious. I am the president of ASEN, which, which is also a, a research uh, company. Now, maganda itong ginawa ng kids. Yung marami sa atin ginakain. Kasi bakit merong non-tariff measures? Kaya maliwanag din sinabi ni Dr. Gimba na non-tariff measures are those measures that uh, is an addition to the limitation on the importation and exportation, which is not a tax. If it's the technique, if all all the measures themselves, or if it's the technical measure, yes. the, there's uh, really uh, almost. Tanong ko lang dito, uh, in my mind, wala kaya tayong way of studying. Itong limitations na ito ay talaga na-impose ng gobyerno para malaman natin na normal yung importation. Kaya ang importation ay ganito, normal, sapagkat uh, hindi nakapekto because uh, nito, na implement mabuti. Kung hindi implement kasi yan, there could be a variance. Kasi kung hindi na implement yan, nandiyan ang kuwan, uh, import na import, pero hindi ginagawa yun. Kaya marami lang import. For example, ito na lang rice clarification. Ang uh, isa pa lang paraan yan para ma-reduce yung uh, import ng rice, yung sabi mong phytosanitary phyto sanitary and phytosanitary yes. measures. Pag in-inspect natin yan, using this, maraming hindi papasa na rice na import. So this is a way the government could reduce the import of rice. Kaya sabi ko sa sarili ko, siguro there should be another study to really come out with beyond the figures. Ang tanong is, ginagawa ba talaga ito ng mga government agencies o hindi? Yun lang yung aking punto dahil sa mga limited, limited kasi yung your resources of Guanila, yung, yung uh, sources of information. So we have to go beyond that completely kasi sa, kami sa research, nakikita natin na beyond the figures, mayroong storya dyan eh. Kaya hindi na tutupad yun, pero hindi na lumalabas sa research. Yun lang po. Salamat po, Dr. Kim Badel. Ngayon ko lang naintindihan itong non-tariff measures as a way of uh, uh, ko, limitation or import and export. Thank you so much, Attorney Salicious. Uh, well noted po. Yun. Um, actually, the, that's, all, that's actually a well-received um, uh, suggestion is also really to look at uh, specific cases um, uh, of uh, importation. Do we look at um, certain products or certain industries and how uh, specifically these NTMs affect the, the, those uh, industries? Any other questions, please? 
Yes, sir. Please use, use the mic. Okay na po siya. Um, good afternoon. I'm Adrian from UP, CIDS. Uh, it's actually an observation, or maybe, I, I don't know if your data would allow. Um, kasi parang uh, my sense is that, um, well, maybe not just us, pero in general, di ba, yung NTM is parang viewed as something that is very negative. Parang something that is evil and parang imposed by countries to uh, do something protectionist. Pero um, I, I was just wondering if uh, maybe, uh, what if the lack of correlation that you found is because um, there are some NTMs that are actually for welfare improvement versus the NTMs that are uh, protectionist in nature. So uh, maybe that's something we can look at. So uh, separating the NTMs that maybe uh, may reason naman why they are imposed versus NTMs that are purely protectionist. And siguro we can find um, maybe a negative relationship between protect protectionist type of NTMs and imports or uh, whatnot. So, yun lang. So, um, I don't know if your data would allow such kind of analysis. Thank you so much, Mr. Adrian. Uh, Dr. Kiba, would you like to comment? The results are very close to what you suggested. The, the way uh, Etherington and Ruta actually defined their um, uh, classification actually looks at the, um, the the impact on to the consumers as a possible as welfare um, or welfare welfare reducing if it uh, increases the prices or um, um, there may there's also an, a way it affects the the businesses but in terms of affecting their process their processes or even if there's a way for it to improve the product quality. So that's why there's a classification in terms of product process or customs. Uh, so in a way that's as, um, maybe as close as we, well, hope, hopefully we can improve on it further, but it's a close way of uh, looking, of doing what you actually suggested. Um, looking at the lack of correlation through um, by separating those that are welfare improving and those that may have maybe um, purely protectionist. The thing is that it's very difficult to say if uh, an NTM is uh, purely protectionist because there's always a reason why it's being imposed. Um, and the, the, the database actually puts puts in the database the links to the specific um, regulations and to the specific rules. So you actually have an, a basis as to why they are imposing uh, these um, regulations. So there's always a basis, but um, if it's, um, so you can't really say if it's um, purely pro, um, on the protectionist side. Okay, um, and also um, there's actually a clarification that NTMs should be viewed as something neutral because as you've mentioned, the, it, there's actually, they can actually um, have a basis in, in terms of improving um, the quality of the products that's being imported through food safety. Uh, the NTBs, so the, there's, there's actually making a, the, the, in the distinction between NTMs and NTBs. NTBs are the ones that's actually a barrier. So there's the ones that may be viewed negatively as because they're the ones that's really limiting trade. For the last question, anybody from the audience? Okay, follow up, sir. One thing is good in this presentation is my own policy recommendation, Mr. Dr. Gimba. I was about to ask that. Eh. Yung constant review of these limitations kasi para malaman natin kung effective ba sila or hindi, which is what this guy is saying all about. Kasi ito'y gawa rin niya ng mga, ng Congress, itong mga limitation, Department of Agriculture, through their agencies, ginawang batas, etc. So, how frequent, yun isa pa sa tatanong ko, how frequent are they 
reviewing this regulation so that they will be current in uh, effectiveness. Dr. Kimba. Actually, the, the, the international community um, tried to come up with this database really as a means to understand because the, the ASEAN is trying to form a community, right? The ASEAN economic community. So they need to understand what, how different are the regulations uh, across, and, and it's not just really the ASEAN, but uh, globally. Um, but the way they populated the database, it's really coming from the interpretation of um, specific country representatives. So think tanks from each of the countries, they were tasked to uh, pour through all the regulations and then to populate the database by following a certain classification. And uh, these um, agencies, they cannot really keep on f funding uh, these external consultants to do it um, this way. So it's, there's really, um, uh, there's really a need for, for example, for specific agencies to really increase their capacity and be the one who would really populate uh, these databases so that the, the information for the Philippines is actually updated. Um, it, it's true that um, because some of these regulations, some of them are as early as uh, 1980s. Uh, some, some of them are PDs. But also there are some that actually not anymore enforced because some of them have been repealed already. So uh, there, is, there is a need to actually um, keep on updating this database. Okay, so yes, ma'am. This is not a question. In fact, this is a comment because I've uh, known about the um, outcome of, of the study, uh, specifically on the difficulty in the procedural uh, uh, requirements of government for NPMs. And that is the reason why I am now with the US I USAID Respond Project. And um, we are focusing on food and drugs, uh, NTMs on food and drugs, because we'd like the importers and exporters of, this produ uh, of these products to have easier access to these importations. No? Well, the, the lead agency for this is the Anti-Red Tape Act. Mm -hmm. no? we, we, the, the NTMs are there. We have to uh, to uh, follow the traders, the manufacturers have to to follow, and so you, as you have said earlier, what drives the the manufacturers and the importers um, to um, difficulty are the more on the procedures. So Arta has recognized this, and they're doing something on this including the transparency of the requirements. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Kim, by your comment. Um, yes, yes ma'am, I've, I've uh, uh, done, that's also one of the um, new developments because the, the Anti-Red Tape Act is actually one of the uh, newer policies that's, um, I think it's not even in the database yet. Um, so, but again, because of their impact on um, because it's it's a non-tariff measure, but may affect also how we are doing our imports. It could actually be part of, of the database. So again, there's a, also a need to include or incorporate those in, in the database. Okay, so that would be all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimba, for your time. Okay. So our second presenter this afternoon is an associate director and senior economist at the Asian Institute of Management. So, okay, uh, and, not, and, not, uh, and not at the 
Asian Development Bank, as earlier mentioned by Dr. Shiar, so we would like to apologize for that. But who knows, he might be lending a job at uh, ADB in the near future. Okay, so let me continue. Uh, our speaker has published topics on fiscal decentralization, local public finance, vote buying, conditional cash transfer, corruption, and ease of doing business. He holds a PhD in economics from the Ateneo de Manila University, master's degrees in economics and in development economics from the University of the Philippines, Diliman, and a bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. This afternoon, he will be presenting his paper on obstacles and en enablers of internalization of Philippines SMEs through participation in global value change, which he co-authored with Dr. Hamil Paulo Francisco and Ms. Jean Rebe Rebecca Labios. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Tristan Canare. Thank you very much, Rowena. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to this forum. The title of my presentation is Obstacles and Enablers of Philippine SMEs Participation in Global Value Chains. This presentation is based on a uh, short and very non-technical paper um, of the same title. It's basically based on uh, a series of key informant interviews and uh, a survey. Okay. Now, um, as a backgrounder, I'm sure we know about this, but in the Philippines, we define SMEs in two ways, one using the employment definition and one using the asset definition or based on asset size. A small firm is defined based on the employment definition as one having 10 to, 10 to 99 employees and a medium firm is one with 100 to 199 employees. In terms of asset size, this is actually asset size less land. Um, a small firm is defined as a business with more than 3 million but less than 15 million in assets. And a medium firm is one with 15 million to 100 million in asset size. Now, um, well, uh, it was mentioned earlier how important SMEs are in the Philippines. They account for 99.5% of firms, almost two-thirds of employment, and a third of gross value added as of the latest data available. We can see here that um, its share in employment is more than twice its share in GVA, which means that large firms are much more productive than small and medium firms. And this puts these medium fir and small firms at a disadvantage. Well, not only them, but also their employees because productivity is uh, large, is correlated with wages. Now, um, there are many reasons for this um, productivity gap between large firms and SMEs. It has been, there are many reasons identified in the literature, including access to finance, access to technology, access to markets, um, regulations, excessive regulations, and entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial orienta orientation and human capital. This study is mostly dealing with access to markets because limited access to GVCs means you have more limited access to potential markets. Now, um, I think it's quite obvious that one of the benefits of SMEs in linking to global value chains is, well, one, it can expand market access, and also it promotes transfer of technology, human capital, and information. When you deal with firms um, from outside the country or outside of your area of operation, you not only expand your market, but you can also acquire their technologies and um, information that you can use in improving your, your business. Okay. 
Okay, um, this study, this short study has two, well, actually three main objectives. One is to identify the obstacles that prevent Philippine SMEs from taking part or participating in global value chains. Uh, next is to determine the extent to which SMEs in the Philippines participate in GVCs and to propose some policy solutions. Okay. The primary data source that we used for this study was a series of key informant interviews with SMEs, business organizations, and um, government agencies for the first objective, meaning that one, identification of, obst of obstacles that prevent SMEs from taking part in GVCs. Uh, we also did some descriptive data analysis from a survey of 530 SMEs in Metro Manila. Um, this survey actually was not conducted specifically for this study. It just so happened that we had some questions that, we, that can potentially shed light on the second objective. This survey was um, uh, randomly, this, the respondents were randomly selected. So there are several layers or there are several layers of randomization. One is city, then congressional districts, then barangay, and then systematic sampling among within the sampled barangays. Systematic sampling means you randomly select a point in a map, and then for every n number of firms, you try to interview that if they are qualified. Okay. Um, for the key informant interviews, we did thematic content analysis. It's a simple qualitative method of uh, analyzing interview data, wherein you try to identify the most mentioned issues by the interviewees, and then assigning them into, a, into different themes. And uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, I, we also did a simple descriptive data analysis of survey data. Okay, um, the first graph that I'm going to show you is a, one of the most straightforward measures of how connected Philippine SMEs to GVCs are, which is the share of respondents who actually export. Okay, these are direct exports. Um, of course, this is not the only measure of connection to GVCs, but this is one of the most straightforward. Among the 500 plus randomly selected respondents, only 1.3% said that they actually do export. Okay. And if you will disaggregate between industry and services, much more uh, industry firms has a much more, has a much higher likelihood of being an exporter than services firms. Um, this was also based on the survey. Okay. Another way by which a firm or an SME specifically can link to GVCs is by partnering, formally partnering with firms that are more likely to be connected to the global value chain, meaning foreign firms or the large firms. These partnerships could be, uh, they could be subcontracting or outsourcing arrangements. They could be uh, applying for a license to manufacture or to sell a product for a larger or a foreign firm. And it could be joint ventures, strategic alliances, or consortium. Um, joint ventures and strategic alliance, these are practically the same, is that in, uh, except that with joint venture, um, two firms try to establish another firm to manufacture a product. With a strategic alliance, you don't need to be, uh, establish a new firm, so you, you just need to partner. A consortium is one wherein a group of firms, partner firms, would purchase equipment or technologies which they can, they can share. And according to this, according to the survey, um, very few or very small shares of firms actually uh, go through this route in trying to participate in GVCs. The most common is um, subcontracting and outsourcing arrangements, okay, but still quite small. Only 7% of respondents did subcontracting and outsourcing arrangements. Okay. Um, okay, so the data I cited are only those from the survey, but um, in the paper, we actually cited more literature saying that, that 
uh, Philippine firms, Philippine SMEs particularly, are actually not too connected with GVCs. Even if you compare it with our competitor countries, particularly Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam, yeah, even Vietnam, their SMEs are more connected, connected to GVCs using several indicators. So this applies both to direct connection, meaning exports, and even indirect exports and indirect connections, such as um, partnering with large firms and foreign firms. Now, uh, why do firms find it difficult, or why do SMEs find it difficult to link to GVCs? Well, um, that's the topic of the KII, but we also ask the respondents, okay, those who are exporting and who are planning to export, what are their perceived obstacles in penetrating international markets? I would like to emphasize perceived because, um, well, it can be it can be due to mis misinformation or lack of information. For instance, we were surprised that uh, high tariff rates in export markets is, is still a perceived obstacle among 78% of the exporters and those who are planning to export. Although the rest are probably not very surprising. Um, corruption, 78%. Uh, quality of infrastructure, still quite high. Okay. Foreign, current, foreign currency fluctuations and difficulty in meeting international products and standards, which I will discuss in more detail later. Now, for the results of the um, key informant interviews, we, we uh, disaggregated or aggregated their answers in four themes. Okay. One is competition. We only, we only placed ASEAN and East Asia because those uh, we've interviewed are exporters in these regions. Next is international standards. Regul regulatory requirements and local institutions. These are very close to what Dr. Kimba presented earlier. Um, next is international market demand and input supply. And fourth is entrepreneurial mindset and skills. Okay. I'm going to discuss briefly each one after this slide. For the competition, um, according to, the, to our respondents, to our interviewees, Many Philippine SMEs have difficulties competing okay, against uh, foreign competitors because uh, they can price their products lower. That's the main, that's the main reason. Now, why? Because uh, Philippine SMEs uh, lack the ability to mass produce. Okay? They are too small and they are not well organized that if a bulk order would come, they Sometimes they have to say no because they can't mass produce. And um, by not being able to mass produce, you not only miss on markets, but you also miss on economies of scale. Okay. And according to them, uh, labor, uh, input cost, particularly, particularly labor, labor, is smaller in competitor countries. Also, uh, me, many Philippine exporters are in the lower value part of the chain meaning they export the raw materials that are much cheaper than if they will price it here and sell it abroad. That would be the higher value part of the chain. Unfortunately, most of our exporters miss out on that. For instance, um, uh, coconut is one of our main exports, but we only export the, the raw coconut rather than the processed product. The same with mineral ores in the mining industry. Okay. Now for the international standards, uh, Philippine SMEs have difficulties complying to international standards and regulatory requirements. Most uh, export markets require certain certifications and standards for products before you can export to those markets. And our SMEs are finding it difficult to comply and there are several reasons for that. One is um, access to finance and credit. Now, for these standards to be met, for a firm to be able to export to its target country, usually you need certain certifications. And applying for these certifications could be expensive. Okay. 
for you to apply to these certifications, you need to pay a certification fee. And sometimes you need to acquire certain technologies, certain equipment, which makes it expensive. And most of our SMEs don't have the capital to do that. So yeah, re related to that is the access to technology and other inputs. Also, lack of entrepreneurial skills and, mind and mindset. Okay. Or risk aversion. Although I have something more to say about that later. Also related to international standards, um, well, uh, for local institutions, ease of doing business is still, is still a problem according to our interviewees. There are inefficiencies in uh, customs and ports operations. I think this is not a secret. And um, inefficiencies in processing permits and licenses. So mostly ease of doing business concerns. Uh, okay, now for under the theme of international market demand and input supply, many Philippine SMEs fail to adapt to changing market conditions and consumer preferences in export market. Um, one of our interviewees said that one reason for this is um, our SMEs who export, their technology and assets have high asset specificity, meaning you can't just, when demand change, they cannot just change their products because their technology, their equipment are designed to, to produce only certain products. Even in more, even in very uh, detailed sectors, for instance, clothing, they said that um, the machine that you use in producing cotton clothes is different than E machine that you can use in producing wool clothes, clothing. So um, the high asset specificity gives them problems when, when demand in the international market change. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, lack of ability to mass produce means SMEs can supply what is needed by the market. And also lack of market information for most of our SMEs who want to export. They don't know um, which export markets they can penetrate because they don't have access to information on, on demand, especially on the willingness and ability to pay of consumers. Okay. Sometimes they also ex, uh, experience problems in accessing inputs, including skilled labor. Now, um, the fourth, fourth theme, theme entrepreneurial mindset and skills, um, this is probably not, uh, this is probably something new to most economists and development researchers, but for industry practitioners, this is what they've been saying. We need uh, our SMEs lack entrepreneurial mindset and skills. Okay. This, they are risk averse. And the risk aversion of SMEs, particularly those that are uh, single uh, under single proprietorship has been documented in the literature. Now, um, it's easy to say that SMEs are risk averse, they lack entrepreneurial mindset, but we have to understand why, why they are risk averse. And my hypothesis personally is one, is uh, the lack of social protection. If you are an SME owner, usually you don't have many assets, okay? You don't have many, much capital. So you would be reluctant to invest on in something that is new, that is unfamiliar and risky. Because uh, if you don't have social protection, if you don't have a fallback, if you invest on in something and your investment goes south, then uh, that would be a big loss for the entrepreneur. Okay. Now, um, for the policy implications, I think I wasn't able to put this in the slides, but we do have some policy implications. Okay. Now, I know this is something that's not new to everyone, but, um, okay, so, well, one is to, one is um, enhancing the ease of doing business in court, uh, especially those that pertains to exporting, such as ports and custom operation, customs operations. Okay, um, improve credit terms to SMEs. Now, I know this is easier said than done because our financial institutions, especially the commercial banks, are reluctant to lend to SMEs. 
because they are naturally more high risk. So there probably should be some kind of government intervention here. And then we need to incentivize exporting of higher value products compared to raw materials. Okay. Now again, the problem here is access to capital. But if we can provide exporting them okay. and then uh, well expand entrepreneurial entrepreneurial skills training uh, I know that the DTI has been doing this but probably we need to expand its reach now for SMEs um, well uh, one is to find new market niche where competition is not yet too tough okay. and then uh, avoid equipments with high asset specificity, meaning if you will purchase technology and equipment, it should be able to, you, sh you should still be able to respond to changing market demands. And consider indirect exporting, this is what Penny, this is what some SMEs are doing. Okay, so they, they list the services of the so-called consolidators. These are, um, these are businesses that purchase small small quantities of export products and then they are the ones exporting them uh, abroad and of course take advantage of government support and networks uh, that would be all thank you thank you so much for that uh, stimulating discussion dr canare Allow me to introduce our last speaker. She joined PIDS in 2016 as Senior Research Fellow, but prior to PIDS, she served as an Assistant Professor in the Economics Department of the Ateneo de Manila University and worked as a consultant in the Asian Development Bank where she collaborated on studies on export-led growth, structural transformation, and potential growth. She has published in the Journal of Development Studies, Journal of Asian Economics, Structural Change and Economic Dynamics, and Applied Economics, among others. She obtained her PhD in Economics from Kyoto University, and she will be presenting her paper, paper titled Discovering the Philippines' Potential Export Portfolio Through the Product Space, Some Products and Ways Forward, which she co-authored with Dr. Ramonet Serafica. Ladies and gentlemen, let us now listen to Dr. Connie Dakuikui. Good afternoon po sa ating lahat. So um, uh, what I'm going to uh, present with you is, uh, or to share with you is how we used uh, the export portfolio, uh, so how we use the product space uh, in order to say something about the diversification um, efforts of the Philippine uh, of the the, the Philippines. Um, so just briefly, what is what is the research objective of the paper essentially is to identify um, potential commodities so that the Philippines can um, produce uh, uh, exports that have high sophistication. Um, in fact, the this is in line with the DTI's uh, new industrial policy and manufacturing resurgence program, where um, it aims to, uh, which aims to. Anyway, so uh, this is actually consistent. Our objective is actually consistent with the uh, new industrial policy of DTI and the Manufacturing Resurgence Program, which aim to transform the manufacturing industry into high-value added industry and uh, in the process be able to contribute more to decent employment uh, and in uh, overall growth uh, uh, and development of the Philippine economy. Um, and at the same time, this is also um, close to the idea of structural transformation. So what do we mean when we say um, structural transformation? This essentially says that for every stage of development of the economy, um, resources have to move out from one sector to another. So that means um, uh, 
from the resources has to move from the agriculture to the industry to the services. So this is the path that is taken by most developed economies. So ang movement nila, most of the developed economies have, have, have uh, the resources have moved from agriculture, industry to services. So what do we mean when we say um, that is the kind of uh, empirical regularity that we observe? Um, the way that I can explain this is if you are, for example, a minimum wage or um, minimum wage earner or you're just um, your income is low, then your tendency is to uh, buy foods, so basic necessities lang, water, foods, uh, and, and that would be the agricultural sector. But as your income um, becomes higher, you, you tend to buy uh, manufactured goods like smartphones, smart TVs, cars, cell uh, uh, tablets, um, computers. So we, we tend to buy um, uh, manufactured goods which is, has something to do with the industry. And then as you go uh, further up the income ladder, your tendency is to uh, to enjoy your life more. Your tendency, the, the, the people's tendency would be to, let's say, um, uh, avail more of the services, uh, more relaxation, going to the spa, going to going to the gym, gym um, more uh, pursuit of hab uh, hobbies, like uh, kind of a bird watching or, or, or the photography or whatever. So more on services. So that is, that is, usually, that, that is the path that had been observed um, uh, that had been observed in terms of the paths that are taken by the, 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 the sorry, developed economies. <laughs> developed economies. Now, what I want to point out here is the blue in the, the yung bin, nilagyan natin ng blue, which is industry. Um, it's very important in, in this process of structural transformation, it's important, uh, the industry sector is very important. And why is that? Because this is where learning takes place. This is where innovation takes place. Um, and the problem with the Philippine uh, case is that we seem to have skipped this part. We move from agriculture to services without even industrial industrializing. Uh, and that is one, one issue that is already recognized by by most experts. So uh, uh, Dr. Fabella has already uh, said something about our economy being uh, have, have, having experienced premature aging. And, and this is actually shown by this um, capture shed. We are already, we captured that by this um, uh, slide. And, and the takeaway of this slide is that one, we can, we can see that the services sector accounts for uh, the most in terms of employment share. It accounts the most in terms of value added share. Um, that, that's one takeaway. Uh, and, and the second uh, takeaway here is that productivity issues in the agriculture sector. Uh, what do we mean when we say productivity issues? Uh, if you take a look at the yellow line, the employment sector um, the sorry, the the employment employment share of the agriculture sector is declining actually, but it's still high uh, at 26 percent in 2016. Um, and then, if we take a look at the value added the, uh, or contribution to the GDP, pababa, it's it's declining. So there's an issue of productivity here. Mataas yung employment, almost a quarter of our total employment is uh, working in the agriculture sector, but the productivity is declining. So th th that's the second takeaway here. Uh, and then, uh, so for the purpose of, uh, again, I, I, I said earlier that what we wanted to do is to be able to say something about um, diversification. And we are going to leverage on the uh, product space. So what, what is this product space? This product space is mm, developed by Hausman and Hidalgo uh, and uh, MIT uh, people. So in its basic sense, the product space is a visual representation of how close the goods are to each other, which is captured by this proximity index. So the idea behind this uh, product space is that it has started from the concept of cost discovery. Uh, what do we mean when we say cost discovery? Um, when firms uh, introduce new goods no, and it becomes successful, they will earn profits. And when, when they earn profits, new firms will come in. And when new firms come, because they wanted to partake, uh, partake uh, on the, the profits as well, they gusto nila makakuha rin dun sa, sa, sa profit. And so when it happens, it dissipates the profit. And the only way for, for the firms to continue uh, enjoying uh, profits is for them to innovate. 
no so in in a sense nagkaroon ng uh, positive externalities because because uh, of the new products people uh, firms joined and then uh, uh they na medyo nahati na no nahati na yung uh, income ng or profits ng ng uh, among the firms and so the only way for them to keep on uh, earning uh, profits would be to innovate so that it will push the production frontier forward so that is the general idea of this product space um but in in a sense what what essentially the the product space is leveraging on is the fact that a country has a productive structure that, that is defined by capabilities so what do we mean when we say capabilities um infrastructure um human capital institutions networks so these are capabilities that are embedded in a country's product productive um structure and then these productive structures are embedded in a particular product. So and what, what do we mean exactly by, by this? Simply, ang sinasabi lang natin is that you can tell something about a country by looking at the products that they produce. So for example, if a country is producing primary goods, then you can say something about its, uh, its level of income. Chances are these are less developed economies. And, and if the country is producing high manufactured goods, chances are these are uh, de developed economy. So, uh, in, a, in a sense, that is the general idea of the product space. Um, so, but the, uh, but the question remains is that why do we have to talk about, why do we have to use product space uh, when in fact there are already traditional um, uh, uh, there, there are already traditional trade um, theorems that would explain patterns of specialization, that would explain uh, patterns of uh, patterns in the trade. Um, there's this Hector Olin, which says that, okay, the country's pattern of specialization is dictated by, by its abundant resources. So if you are labor intensive, then you produce a labor intensive good, that's it. But the problem is there are some observations in the current, um, in the current, uh, past that that could not be explained by this uh, by these traditional theories like for example there's an observation that is made by Hausman and Hidalgo that says that goods have different consequences in economic performance what does that mean it means that the growth trajectory of a country when it's specialized in one good may be different uh, from the growth trajectory that it can have when it specializes in others. So for example, nag, nag specialize ka sa agricultural products or primary goods or, or uh, agro-processing, your growth trajectory is very, is very different from the growth trajectory when, for example, you go into the electronics. So that is just what, it, so that is an observation that could not be explained by traditional uh, three, three, three theorem. And second, there is also an observation that more diversified countries tend to export products that are more unique, less ubiquitous. So these observations uh, are not explained by the traditional theory. And therefore, um, Hausmann and Hidalgo and the people from MIT have, have, have uh, gotten into these products. And that's how they have gotten into this product space. Um, so there are many metrics actually uh, in the product space. But for this paper, we will only be using two major ones, which is the product sophistication uh, and the proximity index. So you, the, pro, the, pro, the sophistication index, no, it's just, it's just a number that is, uh, that is assigned to, specific to every product that says something about the productivity level of producing that particular good. And it leverages on the rebuild comparative advantage that is de developed by Balasa. So meron kang rebuild comparative advantage, and then they use this rebuild comparative advantage um, to, to be able to create an index that accounts for the diversity that a country has, and at the same time, accounts for how unique the product is. So essentially, that's what, that's what the um, product sophistication index is all about. When we talk of the proximity index, it's actually a representation uh, of how close the goods are to each other. So what does this mean? Um, ang sinasabi lang niyan is that it's a lot easier for a country, for example, a country that is um, currently producing footwear, it's a lot easier for that country to uh, produce textiles from footwear to textiles rather than from footwear to electronics, precisely because the production requisites of um, footwear to textiles are a lot closer 
compared to the production requirements or produ production requisites of footwear to electronics. So that's the idea of the proximity index. And the closer the number is to one, mas big sabihin on the production requirements are generally uh, similar. And then if it's zero, then then it's it's uh, it's not. Uh, so we we uh, leverage on that uh, on that um, uh, information, and then we uh, we. Uh, are going to identify the diversification later, but 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 before we do that, uh, I just want to show you this um, picture we which we have uh, taken from the Science Journal uh, from Hidalgo. Uh, this is essentially a visual representation of the product space. So, itong product space na to, you will see that there are many nodes. No, the nodes are either densely connected or sparsely connected. So, there are regions there, um, periphery and the core. The, in the in the periphery, you can see that. The, de the the products are sparsely connected no and these products are uh, essentially are products that have low sophistication content no uh, and the uh, ito yung mga mga low labor intensive products like garments uh, tropical agriculture uh, and cereals now dun sa core no the core you will see that these are uh, this is a region that is really densely connected to many products and the products that are there are uh, products that have high sophistication content and, and these are usually machinery and high technology manufactured goods now there are already studies that says that um, the uh, export portfolio of wealthier nations are found in the core. No? So, big sabihin, uh, core, core products related with, um, um, wealthier, with the uh, products that are produced by wealthier nations. And then, you, when we're talking of the periphery, these are goods that are produced by less developed economies. And, and, uh, and the, the, this one here has um, uh, implications, has, uh, significant implications, because one, if we are, no, Philippines is a developing economy, if we are in the periphery, then there, the, the, the implication of that is that if we wanted to go to the core, then it, it takes substantial improvement from uh, of our production structure in order for us to get from the periphery from the periphery to the core because there are few paths that could take us there because it's dense and sparse yung connection natin eh. we are at the, the the region where the connections are very sparse and that means we have to leap, leapfrog no or we really have to do something about our production structure so that is that is the main takeaway of of, of this product space in terms of where we are as a develop, developing economy now um, we have used the uh, 2014 Comtrade database, which is at the six-digit level of disaggregation, um, just to for you to have um, an idea of the the, the products. No, yung, um, we presented here the first quintile and the fifth quintile. So you can see that at the first quintile, these are usually garments, uh, mga minerals that are. Uh, raw, kumbaga raw, hindi processed, and then mga, uh, ano ba, uh, textile, cocoa, cocoa beans, and then in the fifth quintile, you can see that these are more or less manufactured goods. So we have computed the sophistication index, which, which we call as prod Y, and the average prod Y, or the average sophistication, uh, sophistication index is one, around 1,001, okay, around 1,001. So, um, here, uh, in, here in this slide, what uh, we, we uh, what we wanted to show here is how the Philippine export portfolio has evolved from uh, 1995 to 2014. So you can see here that in 1995 we have a lot uh, of um, agricultural products, no, the ones in green. Um, and then in 2005, you can see that there's only one agricultural product, um, and and we are, have more or less moved on to integrated circuits. No, but here's the issue: nine years after, uh, which is in 2014, we're still producing a, a large portion of our uh, export export portfolio is still accounted for by that same uh, integrated circuit that was in 2004. 
that's a big thing. So that means that we haven't evolved uh, in terms of, of in terms of, of the export basket that uh, the, the the country has. Uh, that, that that's one issue. And another issue is that that, what, that would have been okay, except that if we take a look at the sophistication content of that, that integrated circuits, it's very low. Lower compared to the average in the world market, which as we have said earlier, is around 1,001. You can see that the sophistication content of integrated circuits is around 833, uh, 896. And that, that, that takes me to my second issue here, which is if you take a look at the numbers that are in purple, these are, these, the, these are the sum of the shares and at the same time, the average sophistication content. You can, you can see that there is really no improvement in terms of sophistication content. Uh, in 2000, 1995, it's 722. Um, and then in, in 2014, it's 802. So there's really not much improvement in terms of the sophistication content. Uh, but the good news is if you take a look at the 2014 um, export share or, or rather um, export portfolio, meron tayong mga blue. We, we uh, uh, highlighted that uh, the products that are in blue, these are actually uh, products that have high sophistication contents. Uh, for example, static converters, um, lead, uh, semiconductor devices, uh, excursion boats. So that's the good news. That there are already, in 2014, there are already products that are included in our export portfolios that are more or less uh, um, have high sophistication content. But the, 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 the thing here is that they still account for, they account for a small portion of our total, uh, total export. Uh, yung static converters is only 2.09% and then 1.69 for lead semiconductor devices. So there's a huge improvement that can, uh, there, there's a huge room of improvement that, um, that, 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 that we see here. So that's the, um, I'm going to skip that one. Um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what we wanted to do is to use the product space in order for us to be able to say something about the potential diversification uh, in the in the Philippines. So the, we've used the proximity measure and the sophistication um, index measure uh, as filters. So we have, for example, uh, what we wanted to do here, no? uh, what we wanted to do here is that we wanted to choose products that that the current um, the current export baskets uh, the, uh, sorry again 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 so again so what we wanted to do here is we are going to use the 2014 um, export basket okay so yung current so this is our baseline so marantaying 2014 export basket what we wanted to do is to find products that are close to it and that has high sophistication index so that it can improve our export portfolio so that's what we wanted to do and we wanted to use the product space in order to uh, in order to do that um, and then so what we did was we used the proximity measure and we used the uh, sophistication index measure in order to find out what these products are. So what are these products? Um, essentially, these are products that um, are um, equipments or uh, parts or accessories that are of electrical in nature. Um, uh, speed indicators, tachometers, stroboscopes, so yung mga counter revolutions. Um, and then there are also products that are related uh, to motor vehicles. There are also products that are uh, related to the plastic industry. There are also products that are related to um, sewing machines, iron or steel. So these are the products that we can potentially diversify into given our current or existing exports. And, and we can see here that the sophistication content or what we call as prod Y is higher compared to what we have uh, uh, shown earlier. Kasi pag nakita natin ang Ang ating 2014 export portfolio, the prod Y is just around um, 802 ang average, diba? And then mostly uh, ranges from 800, mga 800 to 1,000. This time, what we identified are products that have high sophistication content. So these are products that are close to, the, to our current, exist, uh, current or existing production structure. And at the same time, 
um, mas mataas yung sophistication content nila. So what so ito na yung nakita, nakita natin that um, the uh, Philippines can can go into or can diversif the diversify into. Now, there are, in terms of potential markets, there are uh, some in OECD like uh, uh, Czech Republic, Germany, Sweden, Hungary, Austria, and then there's one in South America, uh, which is the, which is Mexico, and then Asia. We uh, potential markets for the short-term products would be Vietnam, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, and Indonesia, and then in the MENA region, um, we have Israel, Iran, and Azerbaijan. So, what what we're trying to say here is that. Um, based on our existing um, export portfolio, we can diversify uh, into several products that have high sophistication content. And at the same time, it has markets. It has existing markets. So if only we can, we can uh, get into these products, then th th there must be a way for us to be able to improve the content of our export basket. Now, we did the same uh, exercise for the agricultural products uh, alone. No? So the other one is for manufacturing, and then this one is for agricultural products. And in order for, for um, us to appreciate, uh, uh, we've also shown here in this slide um, the uh, first quintile and the fifth quintile. So in the first quintile, these are just primary products. No? Mga co co coffee, coconut, lobsters, primary products. Whereas in the fifth quintile, these are more these are processed foods. No, and then yung cheese, truffles, uh, mga offal, um, swine, salted, dried or smoked bellies. So, mas mataas ang sophistication content of processed goods compared to, of course, to the primary uh, products. Now, where is the agricultural product? Where, where is the uh, Philippine agricultural exports? Um, I, if you look at this slide, you can see that our agricultural exports are more or less in the fish and seafood uh, primary product primary products. No, and you can see that its uh, sophistication content is very low, around 701. Compared to alin yung matataas dito? Which one? Which ones have high sophistication content? Um, this would be the processed nuts. Um, and then the processed fish and seafoods and processed meats, which unfortunately are goods that are not being exported by the Philippines, not as much as, for example, the fish and seafood uh, primary products or the tubers, legumes, and vegetables. So yan yung, that is uh, the situation of our, our um, agricultural uh, exports. Now, we did the same ex exercise as uh, as before, uh, compare. Uh, sorry, the the um, we did the same exercise as the um, manufacture as what we did in the manufacturing sector, and we found that there are sh uh, short run products that we can diversify into. This includes cereals, uh, fruit mixtures, glycerol, uh, tang oil, and then these uh, short run products can actually lead us or take the Philippines into the agro-processing uh, products, agricultural, pro agro-processed agro rather, uh, agricultural products that have high sophistication content. Remember earlier I was sharing with you uh, this this slide here where in the fifth quintile, the agricultural, con the content, no, the sophistication content of uh, processed goods uh, are higher compared to that of the primary goods. So here we say, what ang sinasabi natin dito is that they're based on the uh, existing agricultural exports. No, based on our existing agricultural exports, we can actually move into um, uh, agricultural products that have high sophistication content. Okay. Um, so in summary, what we wanted to, to say is that the Philippines has a long history of trade liberalization efforts and market-oriented reforms, and yet we have and and, and we still have uh, and and we still have to see a genuine structural tr structural transformation. So that means that you know, what what we we're saying earlier is that um, we should have moved from uh, agri and then from industry to services. But we skip, no? Nag-skip -nag tayo. And, and that, that is not 
uh, in the spirit of structural transformation because industry is a very important uh, element of this structural transformation because industry is where learning takes place industry is where innovation takes place um, the average sophistication of the Philippine export basket barely improved from 1995 to 2014 but that's bad news but uh, but the good news is there are relatively sophisticated products in the 2014 uh, Philippine export basket and some have for some, some have uh, forward linkages to goods with higher sophistication content um, that's for the industry similarly for agriculture um, the agriculture sector can diversify into the production of goods with higher sophistication content as well. So that means from the primary agricultural products, uh, we can actually move to agro-processing. No? Uh, but the caveat here is that the identified products in the empirical exercise do not lead to the most sophisticated uh, products among the agricultural products in the world. Um, the, the most sophisticated agricultural products in the world would be Ophal, uh, yung mga cheese, smoke belly. So based on our empirical exercise, which I've, uh, I've earlier shown, ito po, um, we can only go to uh, yung sa mga woven wheel, we can only go up to the swine, um, processed meat like swine, bellies, poultry cuts, but we could, uh, but we never identified products like um, ophal or cheese. Um, but the, the idea here is that if, if we're able to improve our production structure now, then there is a possibility for, uh, for, for new uh, products to come along uh, and that, that, that can lead us to this, uh, this uh, uh, products with high sophistication content. So kumbaga, if we develop our um, production structures, it can, it can lead us to other, um, other uh, products that have really high to sophistication content. So kumbaga, magsasangasanga na lang yan. No? Uh, and then, the, what, what are our takeaways? Now, the, the number one point that we would like to, po, uh, to say here is that the, the paper does not recommend that we focus only on these goods. So we're not cherry picking here. No? We're not cherry picking, cherry picking in any way. What we just wanted to do here is to assess uh, the country's prospects and opportunities for economic growth. Um, and and, 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 and uh, we just want to assess where the, the country is in terms of our export portfolio and where we can go in terms of direction. So we don't say specifically that, okay, let's go to these specific, uh, specific products. Let's, let's produce um, uh, specific products. No, well, we're not saying that. What we're just saying is that there are, what we're just saying here is we wanted to demonstrate that even though we are in the periphery, no? even though we are in the less connected uh, portion of the product space, there's still room for us to, to go into this core. Uh, there's still room for us to make our uh, export basket more sophisticated, except that we just have to lay out well thought out pl policies, plans, and pri priorities. It has to be set in motion because certainly structural transformation does not happen overnight no we can't we can't be producing uh, primary agricultural products today and then wake up tomorrow uh, producing that we're and then we we're going to wake up tomorrow and uh, finding ourselves producing electronics uh, already that that's uh, high value added we can't do that um, yeah, the, uh, structural transformation it does not happen overnight uh, it, it, it's something that's uh, that's a product of a well, well thought out plans it's something that's that's been done by our uh, East Asian uh, neighbors like for example in Japan early on they already provided incentives to steel industry and South Korea uh, there's this genuine land uh, the, the, uh, redistribution. In China, they attracted uh, export processing zones and forward linkages, and they were able to do forward linkages. So, so if, uh, the, the key takeaway here is that if we wanted to be able to produce this, uh, this uh, uh, if, if we wanted to produce goods that have high sophistication content, then we have to, uh, to really 
think of uh, uh, policies that, that, that can lead us there, that can take us there. Because uh, it, doesn't, it, 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 it has to be deliberate. Our actions has to be deliberate. We need to set a target and our actions has to be towards it, towards that particular goal. Okay? Uh, and then also for our recommendations, what we were saying is that there's a need to create an enabling environment. What do we mean when we say creating an enabling environment? Uh, we have to promote competition and innovation. Uh, we have to promote research and development in, in science and technology. And again, uh, yung, uh, the one that, that is uh, 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 outlined in the Philippine Export Development Plan, uh, improve the climate for export development. Uh, a, we, ha we also have to improve existing trade relations and explore potential trade agreements. And we have to improve connectivity, not only pagdating sa roads through the build, build, build programs, but also ports, uh, connectivity in terms of, of internet, uh, in terms of uh, connection to the internet. And at the same time, we need to enhance industrial policies, uh, meaning uh, increased servicification. So my, my co-author can, can talk about it uh, because she's an expert in, in the services uh, sector. Now, the third one would be harnessing the potential of the agricultural sector. Um, so right now, uh, there's problem. There are problems in the agricultural sector in terms of productivity, um, but uh, based on our results, even though there is so problems, there are still ways in which we can enhance our con um, our exports. No, our exports. There's there's possibility for us to build on the production structures of cereals. Uh, fruit mixtures, glycerols, in order for us to be able to produce agro-processed goods. Uh, and and that, that ends the presentation. Thank you so much for that very stimulating presentation, um, Dr. Dakuikui. I uh, will now proceed to the, um, to the uh, open forum. May I request Dr. Canare? And... Um, Again, Dr. Dakuikui, to please occupy the front seats for the open forum. Okay. By the way, all the papers presented today, uh, you may, you may um, download them from the PEDS website. Okay, and um, just a reminder, kindly um, state your name and your affiliation before asking the question. Yes, Dr. Agustin. Ah, sorry, Mr. Agustin. <laughs> Thank you for the uh, excellent presentation. My name is Dan Agustin. I'm a rice producer, palay rather, palay producer of the farm area. And uh, thank you, Dr. Connie, for giving us a silver lining as far as agriculture is concerned because agriculture contributes only less than 1% of the GDP now, unlike when I was in my younger years, we contribute around 6 to 7% of GDP. Now, thank you for your concept on structural uh, adjustment and the work uh, space concept. Now, the work, uh, because we are down there, and uh, Mac and C Consulting says, Asia is moving forward. For example, China and India are expanding and they are growing in terms of population. And uh, in fact, China announced they will not be exporting food because they need food for their people. Now, in terms of workspace, I don't know why we do not explore much on China because China is now our friend. And uh, we need exports, uh, agricultural exports, which is down, basically down right now. I was wondering why in 2016, we hired the services of outstanding uh, experts from the Duke University, DTI. And uh, Duke University, studied global value chains in the Philippines, such as rubber, mango, cocoa. Where are these, where are these products? I've been to the Bureau of Cultural Research. Ang produkto natin nasa estante lang. 
And uh, there was even uh, a study on the shipbuilding. This was not uh, considered. What was considered was Hanjin. What happened to Hanjin? We failed in Hanjin. And the uh, top banks in the Philippines failed to assess this Hanjin. But anyway, the concept of Dr. Tristan is good, partnership. And the study by PEDS, uh, to be successful in agricultural ex exports, we need partnership. And we have two successful uh, sub-industry in agriculture. This is banana and uh, pineapple. In other words, we have to partner with foreign experts. Why? For example, banana. Uh, banana plantation in the Philippines is now with partnership with Japanese firms. So it's very easy to export because you have a Japanese partner. And the Japanese uh, like bananas. Pineapple, they like it also. They don't even, uh, they eat everything except mata. So if only uh, we can have a sound policy on FDI and tie this up with our agricultural reduction, then I think our agriculture will uh, grow, uh, especially so that we are improving our relations with uh, China, with India, and even with Russia. So uh, uh, it may be a long process, but uh, I think we should explore more on this work, uh, sound space that uh, uh, especially so, it appears that in agriculture we are tied up with the uh, rice tarification. This will only kill, according to the economists today, Philippine agriculture is dying. We should not stop there and try, as I said, connectivity, connectivity with Russia, connectivity with India, connectivity and foreign investments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Okay. Dr. Dakuikui, would you like to comment on um, Dr. Uh, on Mr. Agustin's um, statements? Yeah, point is well taken, especially on the idea of uh, the FDI, sir. Especially on the idea of the foreign direct investments that uh, I agree that we really need to um, uh, attract uh, the correct FDIs because uh, if we have the correct FDIs, then um, that means that we will, ha we will be able to... Um, uh, do some linkages forward and backward, uh, and in, in in that sense, um, it's if we if we're able to do that, then um, it, everything will follow in terms of the development in the agricultural sector and in terms in the development of the industry and the services sector. So I think that uh, one key issue here is for us to be able to attract the correct uh, FDI. Um, that means that if we are going to do that, then we have to create. Uh, very good climate, no investment climate, um, and be able to uh, be able to encourage or attract uh, investors here in the Philippines. Uh, in fact, uh, ang pinupuntahan nga po, I mean, they, they, there's this trade war, and they were saying na ang pinupuntahan ng mga ng bansa is Vietnam, precisely because they have this low cost. No? Um, and they have this, uh, they were giving a lot of tax incentives to investors, something that, um, that is uh, an issue here because we, for one, the Philippines has one of the highest um, electricity rate, so that's a turn off. Second, our, um, our labor market has uh, uh, some issues, for example, in terms of uh, wage rigidity, especially in the, in the light of ENDO. No, so meron tayong mga endo, it, it, it introduces, uh, introduces rigidities. So um, it, it may, and it makes our industry a little bit uh, less competitive uh, uh, relative to our um, Asian neighbors. So I agree with the FDI um, uh, idea. Thank you, Dr. Um, Dakuikui. Um, Dr. Canary, would you like to add something? Um, uh, just a short note. Um, so even if we have access to these new markets, China, India, etc. We still have to make our um, agri well agricultural products, but not only agricultural products. Basically, all exports. We have to make it more competitive because mm -hmm. even.
markets um, if other countries can sell their products at a lower cost and better quality mm -hmm. then we will still fall behind so we still need to make our um, access to markets is one thing but making our products competitive would be another thank you so much uh, any other questions from the uh, audience Yes, uh, Attorney Celicius. I would like to second the observation of the gentleman. Alam nyo, dito sa Pilipinas, pag hindi mo in-export yung product mo like uh, banana and pineapple, the domestic market cannot absorb it and you will not get any profit. The government's... Uh, um, Attitude is uh, very negative. For example, if you, you produce products like durian, pag nagbunga lahat, nagharvest ka, depress ang market dito sa local. The government has not encouraged the maghanap ng market. Sabi nga ngayon, China is the one trying to eat all the durians produced by Malaysia uh, or Indonesia or Thailand, no? Pero dito sa Pilipinas, depressed. I am speaking from experience because I have also a durian, a small durian plantation. Nag-harvest lahat, it used to go from 80 to 120 pesos a kilo. Dahil marami na nagbibenta, 20 pesos na nga lang a kilo. Pinapabulok na lang namin, bakit? Ang cost of transportation from the farm to the markets ay mas mahal pa kaysa kikitain mo sa durian. So, uh, in, in line with that, yung sabi ni Ms. Dr. Dakoykoy, yung i-process yung fruits, the problem is the government has not also involved themselves in the, the technical processing of fruits that are produced by the farmers. So, left alone, katulad ko, wala akong kapital, how could I produce another kind of processed uh, goods from durian. So except yung the usual thing na jam, candies, etc., which is not so much in uh, profit. No? So, sinabi mo sa policy making mo, sabi mo na uh, there should be some kind of a processing of uh, fruit mixtures, etc., etc. You know, in our province, there is one uh, city where they have established a common facilities for anyone who would like to produce their own kind of product, okay? The government of that uh, municipality is, um, is uh, financing it. All you have to do is go there. It's FDA approved, and uh, the, the cost of production is very uh, low kasi, halimbawa, if you produce sardines of your own kind, no? Sardinas mo, meron ka. Pagdating, pumunta ka lang doon, Somebody will now process, mag, uh, they will cut the hedge, etc. Minimal cost. And production of the sardines is uh, overseen by the, the one in charge, the technical people there. So you can have your own bottle of sardines under your name. Hindi ka na magkaroon ng sarili mong manufacturing or factory, which will entail a lot of expense. Doon, it's a common factory for everybody. I don't know why... Government has not taken an observation on that particular platform of business. Uh, kasi lahat, you want to, to produce fruit, uh, uh, anong, anong klaseng fruit products gusto mo, punta ka lang doon. Somebody will teach you and they will be the ones to, to do it for you. If you are just an investor, pera mo lang sabihin, oh, ito lang gusto kong i-produce nyo. And they will find the product for you. At ang balik sa iyo, yun ang bottle of sardines or whatever. So I'm, uh, I'm expressing this because napaka-practical. Not all can have factories. Not all can produce on their own. Kaya ang problema natin is this. Yung tinatawag na economies of scale, nabanggit din yun ni Dr. Ano kanina yung uh, mahirap magmas produce Bakit? Kasi kanya-kanya tayo eh. There is a big uh, order of production for this. Pupunta ko sa isang businessman, magpuan tayo. Magpartnership tayo kasi malaki para sa akin to. Anong nangyari? Hindi, hindi sumusunod kasi 
akin, akin, sa iyo, iyo. So, paano natin ang gobyerno ma-engage yung mga tao na huwag na tayong ganyan kanya-kanya? Paano kaya? Because that is always a problem in attitude. So, sa akin, all your presentations are good. The problem is attitude. Don't kay Dr. Canary din about entrepreneurship. How can we become, uh, may avoid natin yung risk aversion, yung takot tayong matalo sa ating negosyo? Hindi naman pwede hindi tayo matalo eh. Natatalo tayo because from the very start, our children are not educated on finance, tax, uh, kung ano yung mga dapat mong gagawin pag may negosyo ka na. Wala tayong alam dyan. Pagdating mo doon sa maturity, oh, tayo ako ng negosyo, maganda to. Ito na ngayon, hindi niya alam, meron palang accounting system, meron palang mayor's permit, meron palang SEC registration, meron palang uh, nagpupunta na BJ, uh, yung fire department, titingnan yung mga ano mo. So, it's quite uh, frustrating. So, yung iba, hindi na matutuloy sa kanilang entrepreneurship. Dahil ganun pala dito sa ano, maraming limitations. So, sabi ko nga kay Dr. Canary, binigyan ko siya nung pinadala rin sa akin yung Facebook. That we just we should start restructuring our educational system. Yung mga bata ngayon, turuan na at the big beginning kung ano yung credit, ano yung taxation, ano yung tawag nito, yung how to know what is the salary scale ng mga matatanggap mo, etc. Para they are prepared. Otherwise, if we do not restructure our educational program, yung ating mga recommendations, pagdating doon, walang gustong mag-take ng risk. Sapagkat wala silang alam how to overcome those risks. Pagka nandun ka na, saka mo pa malaman kung anong problema. That's why I'm telling you from experience. Because we started also in business na walang alam. Doon na lang kami natuto. But because of our resiliency, na-overcome namin yon At saka meron kaming nag-aaral din kami, bakit nagkaganito, ganyan? Uh, wala ka ng cash flow. Yung cash flow, tinuturo ba yan? Tinuturo, pero hindi niya alam na pagka wala ka ng cash flow sa business, bankrupt ka na. Marami ka nga ang collection, pero wala kang cash flow. Yun ang isipin nyo palagi. When you go into business, always maintain the integrity of your cash flow. Because pag huminto yan, kahit magandang product mo, puro collectibles ka, anong pambayad mo sa mga operational cost nyo? So, before you enter into, uh, tawag nito, sa entrepreneurship, which will go into export, etc., dapat may basic knowledge kayo, practical knowledge, at saka kailangan talagang hindi pwede yung nilgosyo ko ngayon kasi gusto ko na magkaroon ng pajero kagad in one year. Gusto ko na magkaroon ng malaking bike at tulad mo. Hindi. It takes time. Ten years siguro bago mo ma-achieve yung dreams mo. Pero it takes time first to uh, stabilize yung iyong business. Cash flow is very important. Yun na po akong uh, ano, agriculture. We are one and the same. Walang bin ginagawa ang gobyerno. Uh, oversupply ng ano, hindi man lang masabing akin na lahat, i-produce nyo, gagawin natin ng ano yan. Kaya, there's no creativity dahil pinababayaan na lang na uh, yan, ganun talaga ang cycle. Pagka mataas ang harvest, bababa talaga ang presyo. I do not believe in that eh. If the government is really true to its uh, mandate to help the people. Kasi yung farmers, silang kawawa because binibili na lang yan ng mababa kasi Pupunta na lang ng middleman yan. Ako na lang bibili niyan, magkano? Sampung piso. Sige, mabuti na lang kaysa mabubulok. So, all of us should be concerned about it because tayo dapat ang maging prime movers ngayon sa ating generation. Paano natin matulungan yung gobyerno? Thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much, sir. And, and thank you for sharing your um, experience. Indeed, experience is the, is the best teacher. So, would you like to comment first, Dr. Canare? Well, um, thank you for those inputs. Uh, just a short note on uh, risk aversion of entrepreneurs. Uh, I think risk aversion is a, um, it may not necessarily be ingrained in you, but a response to, a, to an underlying situation. If you're an entrepreneur, if you have very small capital, 
if you have very little assets, then you would naturally be more afraid to venture into something that's um, unfamiliar to you with with high risk of loss. Because if you have if you have little assets and capital, and you invest in something, and then that investment suddenly goes south, then you have you have no fallback. So I think um, one policy implication of that to encourage more risk taking would be social protection, adequate social protection for small businesses. Okay, thank you, Dr. Canary. Um, Dr. Connie, would you like to add to what Dr. Canary said? On the financial literacy, sir, I think that uh, that's a good suggestion. Uh, on the financial literacy, that it has to be um, taught uh, even at a very young age. No, so it, it has to be included in the. There must be a way for it to be included in the educational system. This financial literacy, um, and at the same time, uh, for those of us who are no longer in school, um, maybe the government can step in in terms of capacity building. Um, so that uh, we will be more financially literate in terms of doing business and, and stuff. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Connie. How about this side of the room? May we hear from you? Good afternoon. I am Alexander Matoza from Department of Finance. Um, this question, I'm going to ask this to Dr. Tristan first. I have also a question for Dr. Connie. Um, sir, I'm just curious if you all ha were able to find found out to, to find out the effectiveness of the measures the government has passed, like the RA or the Magna Carta for MSMEs. Uh, kung paano po sila? Kung naassess niyo po ba if they were able to actually help MSMEs in some way? Because if I can remember banks are forced or mandated to to save to save 8% of their loanable portfolios for MSMEs so if the problem is on capital aspect i think the law can cover it um well short answer to your question that's not part of the survey and the uh, interviews but we did we did ask the survey respondents who among them were beneficiaries of government programs. And a, the striking result was very few. I think less than 1% actually was a beneficiary of a government program. Uh, we don't know how effective that program was, but what we know is very few SMEs um, were able to take advantage of these government programs. Now, on, your, on the uh, requirement for financial institutions to lend a, a certain share of their loan portfolio to SMEs. Um, we talked with some bankers, uh, particularly the commercial banks, and what they say is it's so risky to, risk to, small, uh, to lend to small businesses that they are willing to just pay the fine rather than meet the specified share of loan portfolio going to SMEs. So um, that's how risky it is to lend to SMEs. So I don't know what should be. Maybe we can um, increase the, the fine or maybe there should be a particular financial institution that is not profit-oriented who will do the lending. You know, you, they just need to, they just need to uh, even out their revenues and costs because banks are, well, they are, these are profit-maximizing firms. So they will really go for loan portfolios that are low risk and uh, high return. Well, if it's low risk, it's low return, but they would rather not, um, they would rather not take part in that risk and just pay the fine. So we need some innovative policy measures for that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kanai. And for Dr. Connie, ma'am, I'm just, I just want to confirm if I if my understanding with the study is correct. If the structural transformation can actually address trade deficit of the country, and if yes, ha on gaano po ka absolute if it's absolute enough. Uh, 
trade deficit. So, pag sinabing trade deficit, export minus import. Or no. um, I'm not so sure if, because the, the method itself does not have, does not say anything about trade deficit. All it does is for us to be able to say something where we can go. No? So, um, and, and that is something that we don't know yet whether we can get there or whether we're, we will be able to get there precisely because there are issues on the production structure. So I'm not so sure, sir, if um, um, I can say that the, the method will be able to say something about trade deficit. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to hear from Dr. Uh, Sheila Shar. Canare, who is from the, from the AIM Policy Center, not the ADB, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tristan, uh, you were candid enough in revealing that uh, your sample respondents, most of them come from the industry sector. Um, the the interview or the your, your, your study? Or the interviews. Um, the interviews, the interviews. Yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> because we, oh, so we go ahead. Uh -oh. However, uh, I'm interested to know, uh, do you think you would have gotten a different set of results if your, um, your key informants no? um, come from, you know, From, from the services sector, but there's equal representation more or less from industry and services. Challenges now, or whether or yeah. Na na results eh, kasi masyadong concentrated sa ano sa services. Well, um, right. We may, we may have. Um, that's one of the. That's actually one of the limitations of a key informant interview methodology, the external validity. Okay. Uh, we may, on the, on the share of, well, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned about the connectivity to global value chains. And in the survey the f of 500 SMEs, which is more representative, uh, we saw there uh, that indeed the share of of industry SMEs that export is almost six times than the share of services who uh, doesn't export, ah, who export, okay. So, so yes, just looking at that, we may have, you may have found different obstacles and enablers of linking to global value chains if there were more services sector among the interviewees. The problem with that is it's so difficult to find a services SME who does export. Yeah, I think in the, in the KIIs, um, most of those are industry SMEs because more, S more industry SMEs export. There are some services SMEs, okay, but they are, uh, they are much smaller. Um, please don't get confused on the two data sets, okay? So in the, we had two objectives, right? One is to determine what are the obstacles and enablers. That's where we use the KII data. And then the other objective is to get a gauge of how connected SMEs are to GVCs. That's the, that's, about, that's one where we used uh, the survey. And we saw in the survey that indeed, the survey that is more representative of industries and, S uh, industries and services SMEs. We saw there that, Indeed, industry SMEs are more connected to value chains. Now, as to their um, obstacles of connecting, well, well, yes, it we may have, we may have come up with different obstacles if there are say more SMEs in the key informant interviewees. Okay. But um, I think these are what I saw there. Frankly, I think that's just a. Um, what do you call this? That's a confirmation of what we already know. We know that we have poor infrastructure. We know that we have uh, weak institutions. Okay, the ease of doing business. Well, we we have improved over the last 
10 or so years, but we've kind of stagnated over the last three years. Um, in terms of infrastructure, we are we are ranked low in competitiveness rankings. In terms of uh, well, infrastructure, not just the fiscal infrastructure, but also the technologic, uh, technological and information information infrastructure, which is very important for SMEs to be able to export, to be able to access markets, to be able to gain information about potential export markets. So yeah, it may be different, but in a general, in a more general sense, uh, I think it, it won't be. If there are differences, it may be the more specific details. But I believe that in the in the grander scheme of things, it may, it may it could be almost the same. Yeah. So institutions and infrastructure, basically. Okay, thank you, Dr. Canare. For the last question, because we have to end at 4.30. Yes, sir? Lawrence Fernando from the Department of Trade and Industry. My question is for Dr. Dr. Um, um, what you discussed about products, and these are directly related to tangible goods. Now, I do understand that one of the points that you earlier raised was that the Philippines has developed a well, a premature age because we like, skip from agriculture to become a service-oriented um, country. At the same time, I was just thinking that if, 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 if there is a possibility to translate the concept of product space into intangible technology that are being developed here in the country, like for example, if you're doing like basic pro uh, BPOs, like easy, then you can translate into higher value services like servicing a nuclear power plant or servicing certain um, certain areas of technology. But then, I don't know if it's possible given the concept. Uh, I, I think it's something that can be explored, except that if you take a look at the, the product space, the idea or the metrics behind the product space, it's based on revealed comparative advantage. So, that in itself, based, it's already based on tangibles, right? So revealed comparative advantage, it's the share over the share, share, share sa country over share sa world. So medyo mahirap. I'm not so sure if we can do that uh, when it comes to services like BTO. So siguro it's something that can be suggested to the MIT people like Houseman and Hidalgo because I'm pretty sure that they maybe in the future it, it's something that can be explored. But I think that's a, a good idea because uh, my Monet, Monet here, Dr. Serafika, is also we're also thinking about doing something um, in the services sector and applying it uh, using product space. But um, again, um, the concept as it is is based on tangibles, and so all the metrics that are associated with it are based on tangibles as well. Um, maybe just a comment because, like, observing how technology evolves, most people are going to work in that like cloud computing, all of this. So it's since that's like our that's the majority of our service that's like the nature of our partners that are being offered to let's uh, to explore that particular yeah. area. Yeah, because um you know, uh, our pro our the products itself uh, let's say uh, production of a good. It, it does not. Uh, it, it's not. There are services that are embedded in the production of goods, and it's it's uh, a good thing if we can um, do something about uh, you know being able to quantify as well in terms of where in, in terms of this product space. But so but but then again, it will not be a product space anymore, but maybe services space or something like that. Um, but it's something that uh, that is worth exploring. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Um, Dakuikui. So we still have one question? Yeah? Hi, hello. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Eric Tamayo, uh, a public servant from DFA. Uh, we do work in the Secretariat. So uh, all of this is uh, pretty much up in our alley. Uh, we've had uh, we've had initiatives related to uh, SMEs under the Boracay Action Agenda and also the Cebu Action Plan on financial literacy inclusion for SMEs as well. So uh, not to really uh, promote, but just to also uh, make a comment on that. I think uh, um, I'm just curious that 
and similar to the question from, from DTI uh, and uh, from PIDS as well, I think it has something to do with the, the sample size and the, the, uh, uh, the, the um, entities, the organizations that were uh, surveyed. So uh, I'm just curious that a lot of those surveys did not find anything or did not deem it important, let's say, uh, uh, to, to have uh, some sort of uh, uh, mobility um, uh, or access, uh, facilitating their, their mobility across, let's say, a region so that they can do business, they can promote their products, or they can find partners. Uh, it seems none of them found that, uh, that a crucial uh, factor in being able to insert themselves in the global value chains. Um, and also uh, something about um, uh, maybe uh, the ease of remittances or, or, or uh, uh, sending money, receiving money. Uh, apparently, they haven't had experience enough to, to, be, to be able to uh, uh, talk about challenges related to these kinds of issues. So it's, it's really more of a comment from, uh, from uh, similar to what the others have already said. Um, and uh, I, uh, for for Dr. Uh, I, I think uh, did did any uh, anything about uh, any aspect of the digital economy, e-commerce, probably uh, came up uh, when it comes to uh, uh, pushing uh, certain types of export activities? Um, because I think that's something that uh, would be a game changer. Uh, especially in the coming years, uh, anything that has to do with the digital economy, e-commerce, uh, can be game changer. It can be equalizer. Uh, but I guess it's it's also a comment for for also uh, Dr. Tristan as well. So uh, maybe uh, if I can uh, uh, invite your thoughts on on these points. Thank you very much. Well, um, I would uh, I would agree with um, the things that you've said, particularly the one on networking and being members of, a, of an organization. I did not show it in the slides, but uh, in the paper, we did some very simple comparison of proportions. Uh, we're, we're, we're trying to determine the characteristics of firms that are connected to global value chains, meaning those who are exporting and those who have partnered with um, foreign firms. And one of the significant um, indicators or correlates of being a part of the of a G, of the GVC is membership in a network or a business organization. So I I agree with you that that's um, that's yeah I agree with you on that point. On um, I think you also mentioned about um, digi digitalization something like that. Well um incidentally not this one but we had a study on that. And based on our study, and I, I think PIDS also has a study on this, uh, the most affected sector because of automation, digitalization, would be the agriculture sector. And some, uh, some subsectors in the services and in the industry sector, particular, particularly those requiring manual labor, those that are repetitive. And in the services sector, those that are uh, requires those that can be automated, just accounting, finance. Um, so, yeah, I think the implication on that would be, well, we have to prepare those who would be affected by digitalization and automation, meaning we have to reskill them, we have to provide social protection, we have to um, reform the education system so that, uh, well, again, education system, we have to uh, we have to provide students with the proper skills that will make them competitive in the future labor market and other similar policy measures. Thank you, Dr. Canare. Um, how about Dr. Connie? Would you like to add something? Uh, I think that's maybe Manette can say something about digital. No, but maybe your thoughts on digital economy. Maybe Oh, 
Okay, so um, I think that concludes our activity today. So I would like to thank our speakers, Dr. Canare and um, uh, Dr. Dakui Kui for their insights and of course for the active participation of our uh, participants this afternoon. So but uh, before we let you go, may we request our participants to please fill up the evaluation form given to you and submit it to our secretariat. Um, on behalf of PEDS, uh, uh, thank you for coming uh, in today's um, public seminar and hope to see you in our forthcoming events.